man's eyes. You know? It says in Ephesians 1, verse 18, it says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know, we need to make sure that our own eyes are viewing things through God's ways and not through man's ways, right? So in the early centuries, a power would rise out of the remnants of the Roman Empire. And it would be a religious power. But would it be following, because we saw that it was having, speaking pompous words against the Most High, right? So it's a religious power here. But is it a religious power that is following after God's true way? No, because it has eyes like the eyes of man, not like the eyes of God. And as we continue in Daniel 7.25, it says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. So look at the three different attributes here, if you will, of this little horn. The first thing, what is it that's an attribute of this little horn power? Speaks pompous words. Okay, so that's the first attribute here. What was the second attribute that you saw here? Persecute the saints of the Most High. Do we agree with that? And what's the third attribute that we see here? It ten, intends to change times and law. And if we look here, let's look at another verse in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 12. Daniel chapter 8 and in verse 12. It says, because of transgression, an army was given over the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. Does this allude again to the fact that this is a religious power? If it's speaking against the daily sacrifices. And not only is he opposing the daily sacrifices, but it says this little horn. I think the remote may. Oh, there we go. And he cast truth to the ground, right? He did all this and prospered. Now, if you have something that you treasure, something that you love, do you just throw it to the ground? No. no. And in fact, that's what this little horn was doing. It was throwing the truth to the ground. And, you know, if you look, it says that he had an army, right, to persecute, or the army was given to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, okay? And he cast the truth to the ground. So tradition would take the place of scripture. Because remember, it says this little horn power was seen with the eyes of man, so his own wisdom, his own ideas, rather than God's wisdom. Tradition would take the place of scripture. Human teachings would be substituted, and the very law of God would be changed by this little horn power. You know? And throughout the Bible, you can see that Bible writers were concerned that men and women would drift from God's word. If you look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 3, it says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So, you know, even as far back as in the New Testament, Bible writers were concerned that people would fall away from the truth, that people would stop following what they knew to be the truth of God, and that they would fall, follow after the wisdom, if you will, of man the traditions of man. So we need to remember that in the last days, tradition will take the place of scripture. But that is not what Jesus commanded. In John 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We need to make sure that we are finding our wisdom from God's word not from the world's traditions, the world's routines, the world's religions, but from the very word of God. Because if we aren't, we might be ourselves having the eyes of man rather than the eyes of God. You know, it says in Acts 5, verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. You know, no matter how difficult things are, we need to be like Daniel and be willing to go into the fiery, or into the lion's den. We need to be willing, like Daniel's friends, to be thrown into the fiery furnace if it means that we are going to obey God. 
And in Mark 7, 7, it says, In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You know, we have to be careful that we are following not the commandments of men, but the commandments of God. We have to be careful that we are not letting human traditions and human teachings substitute for the true word of God. So, you know, Daniel's had this vision and he's seen these terrifying beasts and, and all this strife from the winds, you know, that we see. And then he looks away from that. And he looks up and in Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 it says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Much nicer view than uh, the four beasts that we had read previously, isn't it? You know that just before the return of Jesus, there will be a final call to come back to truth. You know, God wants to call his people home, and we need to be ready to listen to that call. We need to be making sure that we are following after the commandments of God, not the commandments of men, not the traditions of men, but what the Bible teaches. And we have to examine our own lives and our own practices and see, am I doing something that does not go along with what the Bible teaches? Am I doing something that does not go along with what the commandments say? And if we are, we need to ask God to help us to change those things in our lives so that we can make sure that we are truly following after everything God has said. And there's a story I want to tell you to help illustrate this point. There was this boy, or man rather, I guess you could say, and his name was Bill. I say boy because he was only probably about 18 or so, you know, at the time. And he decided, or he was raised on a farm. So, you know, farming was what he knew. Farming was what he wanted to do. But he said, you know, as young people have a tendency to do, I want to be better than my father, so I'm going to go get some education. I'm going to go off to college, and I'm going to study agricultural science so that I can really learn about farming. So he goes off to college, and, you know, he comes back from college, and... Uh, he doesn't have money to go buy his own farm, so he just goes back to working with his dad on the farm. And as he's working with his dad on the farm, you know, his dad says, oh, well, if you're back, I'm going to go ahead and go on a vacation for a while. And so he says, I'm going to give you directions on what you should plant in each of the different fields so that you can do the planting while I'm away on vacation. So they walk around the farm, and he says, Bill, I'd like you to plant tomatoes in this field. And Bill, you know, he writes down and he takes careful notes. And then he says, Bill, over here, I would like you to plant peas. So he writes down, okay, I'm going to plant peas here. And, you know, I want you to plant potatoes here and corn over here and so on. And Bill writes it all down very faithfully. You know, he's being a dutiful son at this point. But then Dad leaves and Bill decides, I'm going to see how accurate Dad was. So he gets out his books and his soil testing kit, and he goes over and measures the soil and examines it and researches in his books. And he's like, hey, Dad was right. Tomatoes are going to grow well here. Then he goes and he looks over and sees, oh, yeah, peas. They are going to go well here. All right, that's great. Good job, Dad. Goes over and checks all the fields and, you know, where Dad says to plant these certain things. But then he gets to the corn, examines the soil, judges it, and he says, you know, this soil is just too sandy. Corn's not going to grow well here. So I'm, I know Dad said to grow corn here, but I'm going to go ahead and plant some peanuts instead. Peanuts will do wet, better here because they don't need to have such a long, strong stalk like corn does. So, you know, Bill goes ahead and plants all the different crops as he sees fit, you know, based on what his father said and what he decides as well. So dad comes back and he sees all oh, the crops are doing well, the tomatoes are doing well, the peas are doing well, the potatoes are doing well. Oh, and the peanuts, they're doing really well too. But as Bill's dad walks around this farm, he sees the peanuts and he says, Bill, where's, where's the corn? And he said, oh, dad, I, I knew you wanted me to be successful. I knew you wanted me to have a good farm here. So, you know, I tested everything and I found that, you know, corn wasn't really going to grow well here. So I planted peanuts instead, because I knew it would be more successful. And Bill's dad looks at him and he says, Bill, 
You didn't do anything I asked you to. And Bill was very confused because he said, but I planted the peas, like you said, and the tomatoes. And he said, you only planted what you wanted to plant. You only did the things that you thought you should do, not because I said you should do them, because you thought so. He said, I can't leave my farm to you if you're going to be so headstrong that you are only going to follow me and do what I say and the things that make sense to you. And God's the same. If we only follow after God and the things that make sense to us based on our own wisdom, on our own understanding, on our own eyes, are we really following him because we love him? Are we really following him because we want to worship him? Or are we following him only because we think that what he says is right? So we need to look for ourselves and say, well, am I doing these things? You know, am I following after God because I agree with it? Or am I just taking him at his word and following him and obeying his commandments and not following after the traditions of men? And that's what we need to remember for ourselves. So at this point, I would like hope to someone could pass out the little review materials here so we could look at a few of these verses together. And I really encourage you, as uh, you get these review materials, you know, this isn't just a repeat of what we've already studied so far. These review materials have additional lessons to be learned here. So it's important that you do take a look at these for yourselves. And you study for yourselves. Because as I said here, I am not a Bible scholar with the end all say all. Who is my teacher? God himself. The Holy Spirit, God, you know? And so we need to be the same way, and we need to study our Bibles for ourselves. And as you're waiting for these uh, review materials to be distributed to you, the first verse that we are going to be looking at is in Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. So we're looking at question number 1. And we are going to be looking at Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. So as you look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, the question says, What scene does Daniel describe in his dream? What did he see? And what did his vision contain? And you may already know this from our conversation previously this evening, right? What did Daniel's dream contain? The four great beasts and what was going on amongst the four great beasts? The wind and then also the seascape, right? So we had the great storm from the winds. He saw the four winds stir up the sea with these four beasts. So that's in question one. I want to skip over, look at another question for, with you. Let's look at question number five. So question five refers to Daniel chapter seven and verse eight. And again, we may already know the question to this, or the answer to this question. Where did the little horn rise? From the ten horns, right? And it came up amongst the three that were plucked out. And what nation or what empire was there at that time? Rome. Pagan Rome. That's right. It came up amongst Rome. And let's look at a, another question here. Question nine. And again, you may not even need to look at the verse because you may already know it. But this is based on Daniel 7 and verse 25. What were the three characteristics of that little horn power? Change times and laws. Pompous words. So it speaks pompous words. Persecute the saints. And then also shall intend to change times and law. Man, I wish you guys were in my class at school. You're better students than they are. <laughs> so let's look at another question here, Daniel. I'm just teasing. They're usually pretty good, but you know. So Daniel chapter 10. What warning did the apostle Paul, or not Daniel chapter 10, I'm sorry. Question number 10 is based on Acts chapter 20. And this is actually one of those passages that we did not actually study this evening. So let's turn to that one. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 through 31. Okay. 
So in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31, it says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul is warning us we need to be watchful against people who will come to destroy the very church of God. So I think I had one more. Oh yes, but let's look. At, as a last question here, let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. So this is question number 15 that I'm looking at. So question number 15. You know, despite all the strife that we have around us, as we saw represented with these beasts that are warring and things like that, we need to remember that God's kingdom is permanent. And if we look in Daniel chapter 7, in verse 14, Daniel 7 and verse 14, it says, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. His kingdom and his dominion last forever. So despite all the strife that we see in our world around us, we can remember that God's kingdom will last forever. We can remember that even if it's difficult sometimes to not follow after man's traditions, but to choose to follow after God's word and what God says, you know, we can remember that we can always be faithful, even when it's difficult, because God is the ruler above all forever. So I hope and pray that each one of us here has made the decision to follow Jesus and God's law rather than obey man's law. And you know, if each and each and every one of us needs to examine our own lives, my life, and see that if there's some way where I am not following after God's law, to ask him to help me to change that so that I can follow after his law fully. So as we finish off this evening, uh, if you'll bow your heads and we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time that we've been able to study together. I pray that you would be with each person here, Father, that you would bless them and watch over them and uh, help them, Father, to know the truth and to let the truth be borne out in their lives. I pray you would give us each one, Father, not eyes of man, but the eyes of God, that we might see what you would have us do in each one of our lives. And I pray you be with each person here that they would make it home safely. And I pray that they would be able to come back, come back again for another evening of study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.